We're good. All right. The Sorry floor is yours. Time. Sorry for that delay, but it's interesting to hear what people are saying. So again, my name is Margaret Enloe. I just, um, so you understand where I am, I'm in New York City, and it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, I will ask for you on occasion to put some things in the chat, and I would just ask you, as you have some of you already, just to put some things down. It can be quick. And then, Brooke, I may turn to you, since I can't read the chat, to say put down what people are doing. But what I'm going to be talking about here today is, I say, say here on my slide, Communication 101. And as you all surely know, there is books and reams of videos about how to communicate effectively. I am going to be talking about some basic, give you some basic tips about communicating more effectively, and then also focusing a bit on having difficult conversations. So one, one thing here is what is communication? It's a, like a thread which runs through a pearl necklace. It's invisible, yet without it, everything will fall apart. I think many of us would agree that if you don't have good communication, you might be able to manage, but eventually things will fall apart. And unfortunately, I don't know where this quote comes from, so I'm quoting somebody, I'm not sure who it is. Some basic facts though about communication before we talk about tips. One is, as you can see here, 80% of the problems in most workplaces, we're not talking about homes, though it probably would be a pretty high percentage in homes as well, are the result of poor communication. And second, people are generally poor listeners. And why is that? Because people generally like to be thinking about what they are going to say, not what somebody is saying to them. And third, self-awareness around communication is often poor. And I think about uh, clients that I coach, communication comes up all the time as an issue. They may be a senior executive, they may be a partner in a law firm, they may be a young student trying to figure out what their career is going to be, but communication often becomes an issue. And by way of example, I had a, a woman who was an, uh, an experienced attorney. I asked her a question one time. She took the entire hour we had together answering that question. So while she was very articulate, she was not very self-aware that she ended up talking nonstop in response to a simple question I asked her. So one of the things that gets in the way here of good communication are what I refer to as filters. There are many filters, one of which is, hey, we're not good listeners. We're not listening. We're trying to fix what somebody's problem may be and not listening to their articulation of their problem. There are other, other filters that I've listed here. And I ask you just to take a moment because part of what I'm trying to do is raise your own self-awareness about your communication. Take a moment to look at these bullet, these, these filters, and it's certainly not meant to be exhaustive. And then I'm gonna ask you in the chat to write down which filters most affect you or most likely affect you. And I'm gonna put- Can the, you go? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, put the list back up and there may be others. I will tell you for me, if I hear somebody using four letter words, I, I just kind of like, it's like, it's grating to me. Not every single conversation, but in professional conversations, it bothers me. So are people putting things down in the chat? Yeah, I can relate to a lot of these. <laughs> Can you say, can you read out loud what some of them are just so I hear it? Absolutely. Uh, rudeness, anxiety, boredom, poor enunciation, invasion of body space, bad grammar, a lot of rudeness, aggressiveness, poor grammar, aggressiveness, hostility, anxiety, <laughs> yes. aggressiveness, hostility, different aims, poor okay. manners. Okay. So a lot of them that relate to these bullets. And again, there are others. One thing that's not on here is when somebody who speaks with a foreign accent, 
and you're kind of to some degree struggling to hear and understand what they have to say. But at some point you might give up a little bit. So anyway, it's a filter both, it, it, it gets in the way of your communicating effectively with people, but these filters also get in the way of your hearing what other people have to say. So non nonverbal behavior, that's another thing that is so important in communication. And somebody earlier today, right, mentioned something about nonverbal behavior. And Absolutely. One of the, yeah, in, in research that was done back in the 1960s, which now is a long time ago, studied what is it that gets in the way of what are or rather three elements that get in the way of of conversations where feelings and attitudes are being expressed face to face. So keep in mind that we're talking about a situation that many of us are not we're not talking face to face right now, but a lot of times we are. Anyway, what are those three elements? Words tone of voice and nonverbal behavior. And you, you, many of you put down as a filter, aggressiveness. Aggressiveness is a tone of voice. Hey, I really don't like what you're doing. Hey, you know, it really, I'm not so happy with what you're doing. Very different tone of voice. But in terms of importance, people provide, give 7% to words, 38% to tone of voice, and a whopping 55% to nonverbal behavior. What am I talking about? Things like eye contact, whether you're smiling, whether you might be frowning, body motion, and more. And I and I was thinking about this, how in commercials, how often do you see somebody walking as they're talking to you? That's a nonverbal behavior, but it, it's meant, and I'm sure they've done a lot of research on this, that we will pay more attention to them if they're walking toward us as they tell us what product we ought to be buying. So somebody, uh, this man, Edward Sapir, who was um, um, a very well-known in his time, anthropologist and linguist, he's now passed away. Uh, uh, Nonverbal communication is an elaborate secret code that is written nowhere, none by, known by none and understood by all. So again, I ask you just to, pay some attention to what are your uh, nonverbal behaviors as you speak. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I get into the tips. These are just kind of some basic concepts around conversation. Last, I wanna focus on the cardinal sin of communication. It is, what compromises all speech and relationship is assuming that <clears throat> what you said is what was heard. And we know from the filters that it's very often going to be the case because of all those filters that affect us, that what somebody is telling you, you may not be hearing or what you're telling somebody, they are not going to hear. And many of you might be parents, I'm not sure. How many times have you had a conversation with your children where you thought you were perfectly clear, you told your teenager to get home by 10 o'clock and they get home at 11 o'clock and say, you say, I thought we had, I thought it was very clear. I told you you needed to be home by 10 o'clock. What is going on? It's 11 o'clock. You're upset. And they said, oh, mom, or dad, I thought you said it was important for me to come home somewhere between 10 and 11. I'm sorry. I didn't hear, you know, 10 o'clock was the deadline. Anyway, so this comes up a lot in workplace conversations. You Think you're being clear with maybe a direct report telling them what your expectations are. And they go off and they do something else. And you say, what, what happened here? So just remember, that is the cardinal sin of communication. All right. So I'm going to shift into some practical tips to build your communication skills. And I think a number of you said, hey, I'd like to have some practical tips here, some tips around what I, how I could be more effective. And then having difficult conversations, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of overlap between these two. So but I'm gonna start first with this one. Keep your hands away from your face. And there's some examples here of what people fairly commonly will do. And on Zoom, what is it that you do perhaps with your hands? You may do nothing. If I were to do this with you and every once in a while, emphasize something like that, I think you'd all find that's okay. If I were to say, now I'd like you to pay attention to everything I'm saying here, 
And I know that uh, you, you know, it's, it's harder on Zoom because, hey, we're not face to face. If I were to do something like that, you might listen to what I have to say. You might even try to pay attention, but I think you'd find me to be less effective. So that's, that's one. I don't, and again, Brooke, if you have any comments to make about any of these. Yes. Yes. Um, I remember the first time you had shown this to our maintaining momentum group. Well, okay. I'm like, ah, ADHD yeah. years. So for those of you, um, who relate to this picture, I see you, um, it's hard when you have ADHD, we can be face pickers. We can be, um, needing stimulation, um, just some tricks in communication um, with people who might be judging the way that you're communicating, get a fidget toy, um, do something to use with your hands so this way it's not on your face, um, just in the ADHD lens. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see. Second. Uh, is preparation, but not perfectionism. Preparation uh, is a wonderful thing and it really makes a big difference. If I had not prepared for speaking with you today, I might, I might say some pretty good things, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't flow as well. And for those of you who play tennis, you may know Arthur Ashe, even if you don't play tennis, but he said, yeah. a key to success is confidence. But a key to confidence is preparation. So you can imagine tennis players, all tennis players are going into a match, they're going to prepare. But it's one, to, it's one thing to prepare, it's another thing to over-prepare. And what I, and that's where I'm saying here, yes, it's preparation, but it's not perfection. And a lot is written, you're probably all familiar with it, that if we, perfection is the enemy of the good. It gets in the way of performing, of doing. And that's not where we want to go when we're talking about preparation. And we know with ADHD, um, we very often struggle with perfectionism, things having to be perfect before we can move forward and prepare. Um, but I always like to say like the B plus is better than the A plus sometimes because at least you know that you're getting it done and you're working on it. So something I alluded to a bit earlier was be aware of your body language. This is part of nonverbal behavior. And a lot of us spend times, understandably, looking at our computers and we kind of hunch over. And some of us had trouble getting back with a good posture. And body language really is so important. And if you're, if you're kind of in this inward shrunken pose, if I were like talking to you like this, again, you'd probably say, mm, okay, not so effective. Margaret, no, shoulders back. It's, it's both of impacts how you feel as well as how you are perceived. And if you're in a shrunken pose, people are going to perceive you as being less powerful, less influential. Like, why do I even bother spending time with this person? And there's, a, there's an interesting TED Talk by a woman named Amy Cuddy. And here you see her with her power pose. Have any, have any of you heard of power pose? Maybe just put in the chat, yes or no. Have you ever? And yes, if you it's a, Amy like Cuddy. Superman pose, the Wonder yeah, Woman. Like, yeah, okay. And as she says, body language speaks volumes. She talks about how this, the impact on our, on our, how we feel about ourselves, depending on how we're standing, how we're even sitting, what our posture is. And she talks about in her TED talk, how when we have this open pose, power pose, our testosterone tends to increase and our cortisol, the stress hormone, decreases. So she suggests before you're doing, a, let's say, a speech presentation, you're nervous about going into a meeting, you're about to have a tough conversation, conversation take a power pose for two minutes. And I, I checked yesterday to see how many people had looked at this TED Talk. It's almost 67 million people. So it's something worth paying attention to and fits in very much to what I was talking about, um, our body posture. 
and, and how, we, how we stand, how we hold ourselves. It's important for everybody. Fourth tip here is don't use hedging language. I just want to say, I haven't studied this fully, but this may be only how I feel. And some people say the feel is the four letter word of the workplace because some people would disagree with that. Some people would say, no, it's important to express our feelings. So I'm not making an, any kind of absolute here, but some people say, hey, feelings, let's not, you know, tell me what you think, tell me what you know, not how you feel. Um, so if you're using hedging language like this, you might say, hmm, am I doing that? Here's a chart where it says, use more muscular language. And it gives you on the left side phrases that you might use and how to make them a little more powerful on the right hand side. Personally, I like the last one the best because I think it's, uh, and, and the second one, I tend to agree. I think we use that often as a way of not being in somebody's face. You can say, I tend to agree. What I might add to that is X, Y, and Z. <laughs> so again, all these, these are not, absolutes here, but the idea is to use more muscular language as opposed to hedging language. Next one here is slow down and pause. If I were talking to you like this and I said, you know, this is really important for you to pay attention to what I have to say because, hey, I got some really good tips here for you guys. And you might say, uh, talking way too fast, Margaret, you are not a being effective. And when we think about some of the, uh, people, the politicians we've heard, or President Biden, or other presidents, when they speak, they are not speaking fast so that you can get everything they have to say. No, they're speaking slowly. Yes, they do have a teleprompter, which makes it easy, but they take pauses. They're not rushing. So my point here is you're viewed as more powerful if you're not rushing, you pause. And women, I will say, I'm not sure how many women are on this call, but women tend to speak more quickly than men, studies show, because we're afraid that people will stop listening to us. Not a good thing. People, women will also tend to apologize more often. So again, apologizing, if it becomes a habit, men do it too, something to just pay attention to, in addition to slowing down and pausing, okay? And another tip here is, lower your voice. People like the sound of lower voices and they command more respect. So if I were to say to you, you know, I really, that Brooke, it's just wonderful to be here. I think many of you would say, oh, do I have to listen to this woman talk for 45 minutes? Instead of I said, Brooke, it's really wonderful to be here. I, as a woman have, we all it have- Sounds fun. so much more pleasant. <laughs> yeah, and some people, just end up more naturally gravitating to a higher, higher pitch than a lower pitch. But we have the ability to tap into both. And an interesting vignette or side note here is some of you may have heard of Elizabeth Holmes, who's the CEO of Theranos. She's now about to go to jail or maybe is in jail for reasons unrelated to her voice. But she used to talk like this and would tell people what to do and give speeches in this tone of voice. And people thought that was very, like, is that her real voice? It can't be her real voice. And people would ask all sorts of questions about her voice. So the point is, you don't want to do a voice that's inauthentic just to be lower. You want something that's authentic, that feels real to you. But be aware if you are someone who talks up here, that it may not be as effective as somebody who talks here. And in this connection, um, you know, again, women have higher 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 voices in part because their vocal cords are are smaller, but that doesn't mean we can't lower our voices nonetheless into something that's 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 still our 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 voice. Um, and last point I make about this, also a bit of an aside, that James Earl Jones. Have you heard of him? He's an actor, and he was the original voice over for Darth Vader in the first Star Wars movie. And he wasn't even that well-known an actor at the time, but his voice was so low, so rich, so resonant, so wonderful that he ended up getting so many more parts 
and earned well over $45 million because of his wonderful voice. So there you go. That's what I was thinking about Liam Neeson. (laughs) Okay. There are other actors. You can go on the web and say, uh, uh, actors with good voices and they'll pop Mm -hmm. up a whole bunch. And most of them have nice sounding voices. They don't have squeaky voices. Okay. Check for bad habits and mannerisms. It's, um, um, I think a lot of us wonder if we have any bad habits. A good way to find out is ask a trusted colleague, a, a good friend perhaps, and just make it safe for them to tell you honest feedback and say, do I twirl my hair? Do I um, laugh nervously? I had a client um, who every time he told me some bad news, he would chuckle. It was a nervous laughter, but it kind of Actually, he was not a client. He, was, he wasn't a coaching client. He was an outside attorney when I was back in my lawyer days. And it would tr- kind of drive me crazy. And of course, nobody's going to tell him. Some people use filler words, um, you knows, like, right, all the time. So these are things that people that you may have, let, raise your level of awareness and make it safe for somebody to just tell you what they think about how you, how, how any bad habits or mannerisms you have. Some people might get hands on the face. Uh, they, they don't have good eye contact. Um, again, twirling your hair, speaking softly. And last, let's just say if you don't have anybody you trust that you can speak to, you could talk to me, but <laughs> let's say there's nobody in your orbit that you trust to have that conversation. You can just put yourself on video, record yourself, do it a selfie. It's not quite as good, but it's you'll learn a lot. As they say, you'll learn a lot here in three minutes. So are there any, I'm not sure there are any questions, but I just want to pause here for a moment and ask if there's any comments that people have, questions. I know a lot of us can relate to this. People do not like hearing themselves, <laughs> but it's such a good exercise watching yourself, whether it be voice watching yourself. If you're playing a sport, watching yourself, it's a way to learn on how you're coming across and how you're performing. Yeah. You know, it might, if we have time, just take a minute to write in the chat, a bad mannerism or habit you that you'd like to improve upon. Um, you, you, You see any responses there, Brooke? Um, I think people are processing it right now. I put guessing what the other person's thinking. So in a sense, it's interrupting them before they're done talking. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, I anyway, I just think about this. Again, it's, it's raising your awareness. I'm going to switch now to tough conversations. A lot, is, a lot of what I've talked about will make tough conversations easier, but there's some more specifics about it. Here's a definition. A tough or crucial conversation is a discussion between two or more people where stakes are high, opinions vary, and emotions run strong. Margaret? Yes. Sorry. There's two people in the chat who just answered the question from the last slide. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, totally. One, Carla shares uh, fidgeting on Zoom and maintaining eye contact on Zoom. On Zoom. And then Gabe says, thinking about what we're going to say instead of truly listening. Yeah. And another uh, person, Emily, put biting my lip, twirling my hair. Yeah, right. I have a, I have a daughter and she, she bites her lips and I, and I say, Laura, and she knows exactly what I'm talking about. She knows that's her lip thing. She wants to stop doing it. But if we have a habit, it's one thing to notice it. That's really, really key. That's the beginning to changing a habit. And then working on to change a habit is is the next step. So thank you for sharing those things. One thing about this definition that I might take a little, um, change a little bit is where stakes are high. A lot of times we can have a tough conversation where the stakes are not high. Actually, they're kind of on the low side but we still are not too keen on having it. But uh, opinions vary, yes. 
and emotions run strong. If our emotions weren't running strong, or at least part of the dynamic, you'd probably just have the conversation. So I'm going to put up a chart here, which I like a lot. And it's the human function curve. And I put it here mainly so you can see that the performance against arousal and see healthy tension on the left as that's a good thing. Healthy tension is a good thing. But too much of it starts tipping you over into the wrong side of that graph. And as they say here on this chart, there's an optimal level of arousal and stress, which is individually determined, meaning it's not going to be the same for everybody, and is referred to as eustress. It's a word that I think many of us are not familiar with. Then this third point says here, beyond a certain level of arousal, eustress becomes a word we're very familiar with, distress. Eustress becomes distress, which leads to exhaustion and often to ill health, which you see here on the chart. So it's more you know, just to point out that a certain amount of tension is healthy, and if it gets too strong, it's, it shifts over into exhaustion and potentially ill health. So here are some tips. Don't put off difficult conversations. I think we all have that problem. It's like, I don't wanna have that conversation. I'd rather go get myself some, something to eat. Work on me first. Rarely are we completely innocent. The point being there before a tough conversation. If you go into it, well, I am so right about what I'm thinking here. I can't believe so-and-so is giving me such a hard time. If you first, before that tough conversation, think about, okay, what am I bringing to the table here? Am I being a little inflexible? Am I, have, am I projecting some inflexibility? Think about those things. Work on me first. Like a Michael Jackson song where he says, the man in the mirror, <laughs> looking at the man in the mirror. Make it safe to share facts and opinions. I mentioned earlier, make it safe for your friend or colleague to tell you about your, your annoying habits. Here, make it safe to share facts and opinions. So let's say you're the supervisor of somebody and you're really not too happy with their performance. You're not too happy with what a friend did to you. If you make it safe going in, say, listen, I know we're, we've got some things to, to talk about here, but I want you to be very, um, comfortable, just share the facts, at least as you see them. And if you have opinions, I want to hear them. And then you're much more likely to get that stuff out on the table. Um, if you don't make it safe, then you're not going to hear a lot of information that you need to resolve an issue. Fourth point here is, is there mutual purpose and mutual respect? You can understand, I think, intuitively why that is great if you have both of those things going into a tough conversation. But the reality is you may not have either. You may have one, but not the other. You may go into a conversation with a supervisor. You have, mute, you have respect for him and he has respect for you or she does. But your purpose in going to that conversation is you don't want to be bothered over the weekend and you keep on getting these phone calls on Friday afternoons asking you to come into work on, I'm talking too fast, coming to work in on Fridays. And your purpose is to make sure that you have the weekend free to go to somebody's wedding. His purpose or her purpose is to make sure you're on tap for what he views or she views as a very difficult weekend getting ready for a presentation with a new client. So again, you may not have both of these things, but thinking about what you do have and what you don't have, going into a tough conversation can make it easier. And last, listen genuinely. I think we've all talked about listening being difficult sometimes and why. But if you listen genuinely, the tough conversation is going to be easier. I, I also think, especially for like the first couple of things, um, when we're in heightened state of emotion, like you showed in that U curve, mm -hmm. um, that it's really hard to have that difficult conversation because it might not be productive. So mm -hmm. to wait until you are in a place of calm before having a difficult conversation. Yeah. Wonderful point. Wonderful point. Yes. You go in really hot and bothered and emotional. <laughs> it's not going to be a, a good, tough. It's going to be a tough, really tough conversation. <laughs> okay. I say here, don't use silence as a weapon. And what do I mean by silence as a weapon? So here are three kinds of silence that get used as 
quote, weapons, masking, avoiding, and withdrawing. And I'd be curious to put in the chat whether you feel you use any of these. The definitions are there. Some of us left conversations because we're so ticked off with what somebody's saying. We steer away from sensitive subjects that we might be sarcastic. We may cough, sugarcoat things a little bit so that somebody thinks, oh, they don't, you know, they kind of got this figured out. This is such a nice presentation. I'm going to use it tomorrow immediately. <laughs> Anyway, these are three forms of silence as a weapon. And which ones, if any, do you use? Violence as a weapon, something kind of different. Violence means any verbal, verbal strategy, it could be kind of a physical strategy, that attempts to control or compel others to accept your point of view. I'm going to give you some examples in this slide about sometimes what we have family members to um, can like older family members who can use violence as a way of um, being in control <laughs> as sure. a weapon as a weapon right but here are, here are some and actually in that if you go down to the last three those are the ones interestingly that are used most often using directive questions to control the conversation labeling people or ideas and attacking or belittling or threatening. None of us like when we receive those, but these are things that often people will do. A directive question to control a conversation might be, Sarah, don't you think that the best way to handle this upcoming meeting is for me to take on part A and for you to take on part B? It's kind of like that tone of voice, that kind of commanding way of saying it. There are other ways of saying that exact same sentence where it would come off very differently. Tone of voice starts becoming really important. And doesn't, tone of voice is just always important. Um, so I'd ask you again in the chat, what's your style under stress? Silence, violence, or both? And I'll put back here to make it a little easier, the list of, of some of the violence as a weapon, what, what it includes. Seeing anything, Brooke, you can share with us? <clears throat> I think everyone's processing it right now, but I can definitely say that uh, depending on who I'm speaking with, if they make me anxious um, or, you know, if they're on it, if I see them in a different, um, I don't know, authoritative level, I might use silence or violence. Um, so, I know someone just asked me what the question was. So the question was, um, do you use silence and or violence in situations? Yeah, some of these, one might say, um, methods or ways of, of interrupting or sabotaging a, a tough conversation. Speaking in absolutes, many, many people do that. You never get here on time. You're always late. Things like that, cutting others off, Sometimes if people talk too long, you, you kind of need to cut them off. But in a tough conversation, if you do it too quickly, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I try to catch myself with the always and the never. Those are <laughs> you know, deadly words. Deadly <laughs> words. Oh, it, it just switches the conversation so quickly. To, what do you mean? I always do such and such. Oh, well, I didn't mean, oh, you know, always. It's like, blah, blah. you're talking about things that really are not at the heart of what you're trying to talk about. Yeah, I have a feeling my husband's laughing right now. He's here um, and oh, yeah. he calls me out for that. <laughs> so one, one thing I want you to be aware of, of who makes the decision? Again, this is a, meant to be in the context of a tough conversation. Who makes the decision? And here I'm giving you the four common methods of making decisions. Command, this is what you gotta do. Consult, 
why don't we talk about this for a while because I think we both bring a lot to the table and we may have differences of opinion. Vote usually comes after the end of a long discussion where people have aired their, their thoughts, grievances, opinions, and then consensus, which is not used that often because it, because it takes a long time to, for people to reach a consensus where everybody agrees on something. Um, voting, that's what's happening today in Georgia. Uh, consulting might be the right approach. If you're not sure coming into a tough conversation, who is going to make the decision? Smart people are going to say, gee, maybe we ought to talk about how the decision is going to get made here. You have peers coming in. One might have a little bit more control because of various factors. But if it's not clear how a decision is going to be made or who is going to make it, these four methods might be useful to think about. And then it might be worthwhile, given the circumstances, to think about hmm, how are we going to make a decision here, if a decision needs to be made in this tough conversation. And then third, or not, it's not third, but who does but what by when? A lot of times we come out of tough conversations and we've expended a lot of energy and emotion trying to get something resolved. We might've been a little bit of yelling going on, <laughs> a lot of questioning whether what we've talked about makes any sense. And you come out of that discussion so, so glad it's over. But then what are the next steps? So, so to make it really valuable to the extent you can, what I've written down here is make the deliverables crystal clear. This is more in a work environment. Set up, set up a follow-up time. You may have be the, you may be the um, employee reporting up to a supervisor, and you've been really annoyed with what this supervisor has done in the past. You've gotten up your nerve to speak to this person about how they annoy you. They've been genuine in listening to you, and you're feeling a lot better. But if you've agreed to certain things, like they won't do X or Y. They'll communicate with you before sending out a memo to so-and-so. If you set up a follow-up time, when could we talk about this again, just to confer on how things are going? Then, okay, let's do that in a month. We can discuss this in a month. You put it in your calendar. And when that time comes, you have the perfect green light opportunity of saying to your supervisor how you now feel. Okay, so that's why setting follow-up times, depending on the circumstance, is very helpful. Record commitments, hold yourself and others accountable. And in my, in my coaching work, of course, holding others accountable, helping them to hold themselves accountable comes into play a lot. They can say, I'm going to- I think do also the, sorry. No, you, oh, I was just going to say, they can say, okay, I'm going to do these two things before we next meet. And- if, if there's no, if they're not holding themselves accountable for doing that, well, it's nice they said that, but where might they go with that? Yes, Brooke, sorry. Yeah, no, I just want to acknowledge the recording the commitments too, because um, especially in the workplace, like you said, mm -hmm. I know in my past life when I had a boss and even some of my contractors right now, um, might feel embarrassed recording the commitments like, oh, I, I can't remember it. But really, it's a sign of respect, I think, if you are recording the commitments because the person knows that you're taking it seriously, you have it written down, and you're processing it, and you're going to come back to them with those commitments. So um, I would challenge some of you who might be anxious or weary about recording the commitments to actually take that step and say, hey, you know, I come with a notepad to your boss and be ready to record and, you know, say, Hey, would it be a problem if I was to write down these commitments in our meeting? It will help me make sure that I'm following up on exactly what you said. And then you could even repeat back what you thought you heard from them just to get clarification too. Yeah. So this is in a sense, these are key ingredients to following up, uh, following up and finishing a, a tough conversation again, depending on the environment. Um, 
But I think it's, it's very, let's say you're talking to somebody who is not a good listener and we all know people who are not good listeners. If you, <clears throat> excuse me, set a follow-up, an agreed follow-up time and you record your commitments, I think we agreed on A and B, is that right? And they're, excuse me, what? I think we agreed on A and B, is that right? Yeah, 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 that's right, A and B, good. See, you might, they may not have heard you the first time, but you've got something recorded. It's much more likely that that, that is, something is going to happen that's good and that this tough conversation doesn't have to happen a second time or at least in the same way. Um, I'm going to finish with this quote here. Good communication is the bridge between confusion and clarity. It's sort of going back to the last slide. It's by uh, a man named Nat Turner, who was a priest in the early... Um, 1800s. And if you make your deliverables clear, follow up times, record commitments, you're much more likely to have this good communication as defined by Matt Turner. All right. And I think here is my contact information. You can certainly reach me through Brooke if you have something you want to talk about. Um, with me directly, I'm happy to do that. And then I, I, I think, uh, Brooke, if you want me to, I can share the, these, this slide deck so people can have that, uh, which might- Yes, be that would be amazing. I know someone in the chat had asked that. Um, so certainly that would be fantastic. Uh, we're also gonna send out the video afterwards. Um, and you're always so helpful, Margaret. Like I know that you came to one of our groups and I said, we need to have you back at a larger audience because more people need to hear this. And, you know, good communication is good communication, whether you have ADHD or not, and sure. just trying to bring that ADHD lens into it. But you, this is really helpful. A lot of us can choose silence and violence in different situations. And these tips that you're sharing definitely continue to bring insight to me. I, and I, I see in the chats, it's bringing insight to other people too. That's great. And again, as I said earlier, in the very beginning, a lot of people are not that self-aware. And this is uh, meant to help you raise your level of self-awareness, because that is the very beginning of trying to improve things. You And so um, anyway, Brooke, you um, appreciate your comments. And as you said, communication is important for everybody. And we can all everybody can improve on their communication. <laughs> so no matter absolutely. what you are, yeah. Absolutely. So I know we have about nine minutes left. Um, this would be a really good time for you in the chat. Um, everyone who came, who listened, thank you for staying the whole time. It's not always that people stay the entire presentation. So obviously what you were saying was valuable and captivating. Do you guys have any questions? I know in the beginning, all of you shared why you were here. Um, so if you have a question related to something that Margaret said, or um, a question related to something that brought you here, um, now would be the time to ask that. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes if that's okay with you, Margaret. Sure. Would you mind, Brooke, just saving the chat for me I'm having, a, it's a little hard for me on, for reasons I can't explain to save the chat. And I'd like Absolutely. to- Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Does anyone have any questions? We have Margaret here, um, you know, again, so grateful for you to give up your time today to help educate us. Um, Ashley asked, can you recommend any good books, resources on learning about body language? Um, just on body language, no. There's a book that, um, How to Say It for Women, I think Ashley is, a, okay. How to Say It for Women, Communicating with Confidence and Power Using the Language of Success. It's not focused on body language, but that that's one book. It's by a woman named oh, Phyllis Man, Mandel, or Mendel, M-E-N-D-E-L-L. -L. How to say it for women, communicating with confidence and power. Um, you know, there's a wonderful book came out quite a few years ago called The Confidence Code, which has all to do with how it's focused more on women, sorry, 
about how people don't have confidence and what can help them gain it. And it was a bestseller. I think it was a bestseller written by two women. And that would be another book to tap into the confidence code, because I'm sure things are in there about, about body language. I know that, um, Gabe asked, is there a book or videos that comes to mind that you recommend to learn more? Uh, the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, if you haven't seen that. And, you know, I'll, I'll send you, um, Brooke, maybe one or two uh, that, that could be useful. Their names, I'm, I, I, we rearranged our books last night in, my, in this room where I am. And so I don't have them quite in my fingertips. That's okay. Oh, good. I know that you also love Crucial Conversations as oh, right. a book yeah. to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crucial Conversations is a great one. Yes. Thanks for rem reminding me. Absolutely. That would be a very Absolutely. good one to look at. It's not that long. Trace. Yeah. And it's a great, like just reference source. Yeah. Um, Tracy says you had mentioned the cardinal sin of assuming others heard what you meant to say. Mm -hmm. What strategies would you advise to ensure your ADHD child hears what you meant to say? It's, it's That's a, a tough one. What I would say, and this is good for young children as well as older people, you tell them something, again, thinking of the cardinal sin of communication, you say to them, Tommy, I just spoke to you about X and Y. Can you just repeat back to me what I told you? Now, Tommy may not have listened at all and be able to do that. But asking them to repeat what you said or say, Tommy, is what about what I just told you, are you unclear about? Anything that I just said that you don't understand, that's not clear. And I would, that's how I talk to a younger child. Like to an older person, I would handle it a little differently, of course. <laughs> but trying to get people to confirm what you have just told them is a great way of, of making sure they've heard it the way you want them to hear it. I love that. I would also say that when you're talking to someone to make sure that it's a good time for them, even if it's a child, you know, is now a good time to chat. Um, because if they're thinking about something else, if they're stressed about something, they're not going to hear what you're having to say, and it's not going to go over well too. Right. Sure. Exactly. Ashley said, um, are there any books also for professional etiquette in the workplace for ADHD or specifically when dealing with supervisors, like having to interrupt fun convos they're having with buddies for work-related questions that you need to ask, but aren't dire. I don't know any professional etiquette books in the workplace for ADHD or specifically, do you know any professional etiquette in the workplace books? Um, no, I don't. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't ones there, but, um, it's it, most of the books that I've written or spent time with are ones that talk about ways in which to improve communication and, you know, how to, how to say things in a way that people will, uh, both listen and be respectful of, of what you have to say. Etiquette is a lot about not using harsh language, using a good tone of voice, um, having good body language. So to some degree, I hearken back to some of those things that I talked about earlier in terms of good etiquette. You know, you know, you have slump on shoulders or your eyes are wandering away from the person. That's, one could say, that's not very good etiquette. It might be hard to keep your eyes on somebody, especially in the Zoom environment, but good eye contact, um, uh, nonverbal behavior, if you're sort of turning your shoulder away from somebody, it's a suggestive of, hey, I'm not really too interested in what you have to say to me. So body, good body language, a to good tone of voice. I think these are all etiquette things that you can practice and keep in mind for any conversation. Definitely. I just put something in the chat that I Googled. I saw on Amazon. Um, I don't know anything about it. Um, but when I looked that up, this is what came up winning in business with ADHD, 13 rules to make ADHD work for you. So might be something. 
well, there you go. Like that's a that's a, that's a useful uh, book, I hope, tool. And again, you know, as I yeah. said, Andy Cuddy talk. It. I don't know. I don't know other videos. There are, I'm sure, out there many, many, but I just, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know ones to recommend right now. Margaret, can you put your information in the chat before everyone signs off so they can copy and paste it in case they want to get in touch with you? Sure. There's my website. My email. And then on LinkedIn, it, it it's... You know, it's linked, just look up my name, Margaret Enloe. There's one other woman there that's got my name. She's in, I think, South North Carolina. <laughs> we talked to the but I'm I'm up there. You'll you'll recognize my face. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully awesome. I don't know that you need. Oh, I know what I could give you though. Calling me is I don't recommend it. I recommend an email if you if you want to touch base with me. Um, because I I I don't pick up a lot of phones that I don't recognize, but that's my phone. Awesome. The best way to be in touch with me is to email me. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And someone just wrote that um, Crucial Conversations has videos on YouTube as well for those of you who don't have the book or even has the book, but wants to listen to the videos and conversations. Margaret, thank you so much again for being here. I know I learned a lot and I can see by the chat that everyone else here has taken away a lot. And um, we very much appreciate your time. Well, you're very welcome. It's nice speaking with all of you and Brooke. Nice, nice seeing you again. And I did Always. get the chat. Okay. I have I have the chat, so I'm okay on that. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Right. Awesome. Thank you again, Margaret. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.